Hello, as we come now to the fourth weekend or fourth Sunday of the Advent time, this is always a very uh, special Sunday. It stands usually, as always, right before the celebration of the birth of Jesus, the Christmas event. And uh, this year, the uh, Gospel, Matthew, as we have mentioned, has been our guide. And so the opening uh, story in the Gospel comes also from Matthew. So the readings are, to begin with, first of all, first reading comes from Isaiah, chapter 7, verses 10 through 14. From the letter of Paul to the Romans, chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. And then from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 18 through 24. <clears throat> now, as we have mentioned before, there are two Gospels that have what we call conception or birth stories connected with Jesus, Luke being one, Matthew is the other. Now, in Matthew's first chapter, there are two events. The first, which will not be part of our reading this weekend, but which is important to notice, is a genealogy. Now, a genealogy is a list of names that begin at some time in the past and lead up to the future. In Matthew's case, and this genealogy runs from verses 2 through 17, so verse 1 of Matthew begins by simply saying, this is the story connecting son of uh, uh, David, son of Abraham. So it traces the story of Jesus back to the very beginning. Now, this genealogy uh, has a list uh, of many unfamiliar names and some rather unspeakable Hebrew names. So if you're looking at this and when you check this out, we'll see that it is very neatly constructed. It is constructed in a series of three. Um, <clears throat> which lead to when, and there's a little bit of uh, biblical numbering or arithmetic going on here, lead, uh, begins by identifying 14 generations, then divides that by three. So tells the story from Abraham to David, from David to the time of the exile, and from the time of the exile to the Messiah. When one puts those 14 generations together, then divides that 333, um, ultimately brings to a conclusion um, the fact of uh, seven great generations leading up to the birth of the Messiah. Now, in looking at the list of these names, as we mentioned, many of them we really don't know much about. Um, and it's important to notice here that what uh, this genealogy is attempting is not a historical tracing, kind of sometimes like we do uh, genealogies to see where we came from checking the DNA. That's not the po point or purpose of these genealogies. It's rather to list how uh, the kind of tradition from the past leads to the coming of the Messiah. So it begins with Abraham, and of course Abraham is considered to be, you remember, the founder, he, he and Sarah, of the Jewish family or the Hebrew community. And all generations ultimately in Israel flow from uh, their offspring. Now, um, in looking at this, and um, you can check this out, um, we really will not hear this, although it is used uh, uh, during the special days leading up to the birth of Jesus, known as the O Antiphon Week, but um, otherwise you don't really hear these names um, proclaimed. Among them, of course, is Abraham, as I mentioned, David, of course, who is the great king, 
and wants to also, and this is one of the purposes of this genealogy, connect the line of, of Jesus with the Davidic line. Now, this genealogy ends with mentioning Mathan, who is the father of Joseph. And so in the infancy stories of uh, Matthew, the key figure is Joseph. Uh, that's true both in chapter one and later on with, with some of the material that fills our liturgical year in chapter two of, um, of Matthew's gospel. So all of that is um, important to notice. Uh, everyone who kind of studies the genealogy of Matthew will notice that what is unusual in this genealogy is the inclusion of four women. Usually genealogies are pretty, pretty patriarchal, pretty masculine. And uh, so the argument uh, often is raised and those who look at this thing uh, wonder why these four women are named. Namely, who are they? Um, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and the wife of Uriah, whom we know as um, <clears throat> Bathsheba. Now, when we look at them, what we notice is that all four of them are non-Jewish in origin. Um, and so this is important because in Matthew's story, there is a strong Gentile connection that's brought out even in these infancy tales. And secondly, why these women are included is that there is an aura of sexual impropriety uh, which surrounds each of the persons. Now, do you know what each of them are? Uh, they're kind of interesting. Tamar, who was a daughter-in-law to uh, Jacob, one of the great patriarchs. I won't go into the whole story, but in a way to save the family reputation and the family lineage of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob um, has uh, relationships with her husband, with her husband's father. Her husband has died, so this would be her father-in-law, and produces an offspring which saves the lineage of the patriarchs. Then there is Rahab, who is noted for hiding. You will remember when the Israelites are ready to take uh, the promised land, they come to the city of Jericho. She hides out some Jewish spies and um, in kind of thanksgiving for protecting them from when they are going to be get arrested by the Jericonian police, um, says, please save my house my family, and they say, yes, we will do that when we take the city, when Jericho uh, falls to the hands of the Israelites, if there is this red rope hanging from your balcony, we'll save your people. And so Rahab, who by the way is a prostitute, saves her family, and uh, that's why she is remembered. Then there is Ruth, of course, who was a, uh, comes from the tribe of Moab, was a Moabite, and she, you will know her story, Ruth, one of the more beautiful books in the Hebrew collection, uh, saves her family, and she becomes the grandmother of David, and that's her uh, story. And then, of course, most everyone knows the story of David and Bathsheba, but it is one, their son, uh, Solomon, ultimately, who uh, carries on the Davidic line. Now, having said that, one will notice that each of these women, in a certain way, conceive children uh, or protect the conception of children in an extraordinary way, and which leads up to the fact that there is a fifth woman now who is included in the infancy story, namely Mary. So that's a little bit of a background to the genealogy, which we won't be hearing, but which is important uh, to keep in mind as the second part of chapter one, which is what we will hear, verses 18 through 24, gives Matthew's account of the birth of Jesus. It's very sparse. 
It's not clear with regard to date, place, all of this is missing. And as I mentioned, the story is told from the perspective of Joseph. So it begins by <clears throat> the fact that Joseph discovers that his betrothed wife, Mary, is with child. <clears throat> now, betrothal, you remember, and we really mentioned this before, is part of the marriage custom of the Mediterranean world of Jesus' time. And namely, betrothal, these marriages were always, by the way, arranged by families, and it would be generally fathers who initiated this uh, kind of arrangement, would meet uh, the bride's father and the groom's father, would negotiate terms, and then <clears throat> the betrothal period often lasted almost a year. The couple did not live together. Um, the uh, groom uh, went to his home, prepared uh, kind of to bring his new wife later on into his family, and she went and lived again with her family. <clears throat> so betrothal, however, said that it was as bond, bounding, as binding, I suppose is a better word here, uh, between the two <clears throat> as marriage itself. And therefore, if a woman were to be found pregnant during this period, other than the man whom she was betrothed to, she would be guilty of adultery and could be, even according to Jewish law, be stoned. <clears throat> so that's the situation. Uh, it begins, Joseph discovers, however he learns this, can only imagine that, there's a lot of fill in the blanks here, but Matthew's point is kind of, again, to respect the fact that the conception of Jesus as the Messiah happens in a unique way. See, and this is uh, the one characteristic that unites Matthew's gospel with Luke's. Both kind of present very different stories of how the conception of Jesus uh, takes place. So Joseph is now considering that this uh, Mary is with pregnant, of, and here is he emerges as perhaps the quality that is most recognized by Matthew and by others as the just man. Now, if he div uh, divorces her publicly, well, he brings shame. Particularly, he brings shame in some ways to both uh, fathers, but particularly to the father of Mary. And so he is thinking, rather than to publicly divorce Mary, which he could do, that the tradition would allow that, to quietly um, divorce her. What this would do, and it's interesting why Joseph perhaps is considered to be really a remarkable fellow, as Matthew tells it, by quietly divorcing Mary, gives Mary's family an opportunity to find out who the real earthly father of Mary is. And that will <clears throat> protect the honor of Mary's family, but also the honor of his own family, and prevent any shame being brought upon them. So this is his plan uh, to quietly end the whole relationship, to let things play out in a way <clears throat> that brings honor and a lack of shame to both families. It's at that point that Joseph receives a dream. Now, dreams play an important part in Matthew's story. Perhaps <clears throat> it is a remembrance that there was in earlier times another Joseph who was uh, connected with dreams that you remember was the son of uh, Jacob who had been sold by his brothers into slavery uh, into Egypt, and who had emerged as, and the stories connected with him as a great dreamer, um, often through his dreams communicated uh, events that were going to happen. And in a biblical sense, now we perhaps would smile and say, what do you mean dreams tell us things? Well, it's a literary but important form 
in the <coughs> tradition of Israel through which God can communicate God's message. So in this dream that Joseph has, he is told, do not be afraid to take Mary into your household. Um, in fact, uh, the son, and it's interesting here now that information is given that, remember, no one would know until a child was born in those days that Mary would was had conceived a son, and says the angel, you are to name him Jesus. So the ability in uh, Matthew's story is that Joseph is the namer of Jesus. Jesus, of course, his name in Hebrew would have been Joshua, and it means God saves. So the name Jesus, of course, comes from the fact that the New Testament is written in Greek, and so that's, of course, the way in which we are accustomed to remember Jesus and to honor him. So <clears throat> all of this is the part of the story that we uh, will hear th this week. <clears throat> um, he then uses, and this is another, he being um, uh, Matthew, another characteristic of Matthew's style is he likes to use what we would call quotations or predictions from the Hebrew Bible coming to fulfillment in New Testament times. Now, to be very careful here, that these predictions which are assigned to people in the Old Testament may not have had in mind what Christian interpreters uh, see. Um, and in some ways, and we'll only see one here in the little episode we're looking at this time, in some ways, one might almost say that Matthew has created these predictions. Yes, people in the past have said these things, but what they had in mind may not have been, as I said, what Matthew was uh, considered. And what is this? Quote, the quote that we will be hearing. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and he shall be called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Now, this term, Emmanuel is important for Matthew because it begins, as we heard this, we'll hear this time, his gospel story of Jesus and the word Emmanuel ends his gospel. Behold, God is with, the Lord is with us even to the end of time. And so interpreters, keep in mind that that's what we're looking at here, is how to read Matthew's gospel uh, see the term Emmanuel as perhaps the two great bookends to his whole story of Jesus. God is with us, it's the beginning story. God continues, Jesus continues to be with us as the gospel ends. All right, so that's just one consideration uh, to look at. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Now, where does that come from? Well, it comes from the book of the prophet Isaiah, our favorite, of course, um, prophet, as we mentioned, in chapter 7. Now, a little bit of a background of what's going on here as we <clears throat> uh, listen to this. In the days of Isaiah, at which point the kingdom of Palestine Israel had been divided, you remember, into two sections, the kingdom of the north, called Israel, and the kingdom of the south, called Judea, um, finds <clears throat> Isaiah as speaking with Akaz, who is the king of Israel, and uh, things have not gone so well here. Um, in fact, uh, threats have been made against uh, the northern kingdom by the forces of uh, uh, um, Assyria. And there is now the temptation on the part of Akaz to enter into a relationship that is a political re a relationship with the Assyrians to save, um, 
save his kingdom. It's at this point that uh, Isaiah appears and says to Akaz, ask of God a sign, because God is on your side, and God is not going to let this happen, and you don't need to enter into any alliances with other powers, but trust in God. Uh, and that's the position that Isaiah takes. But the position of Akaz is, yes, I believe in God, and yes, we are the servants of God, but that's not the way it's go going to work out. Um, so I, I, I will not ask of God a sign. Now it sounds like Akaz is kind of being humble here, um, not putting God to the test, and that's fair enough to say that, but um, that's not what he means here because he, uh, and, and Isaiah knew this, that Akaz had already uh, secured help from the king of Assyria. So. Um, what does he say? Behold, now here's where an argument, and keep in mind that we're looking here simply at a biblical understanding, not as the way in which as a Christian community we have interpreted this phrase. But the original phrase, after all in Hebrew, would have called, uh, said that behold, a young maiden is with child. Now, in Hebrew, the word is Alma, which means a young woman, certainly, and here are different ways in which that could be understood, a young woman who is of marriageable age, and so perhaps she is a virgin, perhaps not. Now, this young woman, it was, was, was she the wife of the king? Was she the wife of the prophet? Was she the wife and some unidentified young woman? So those are three possibilities that analysts of this little but important phrase make. Most agree that the second and third were, were not the case, and that it's the first case. That this was a wife of Akaz, who now, the word virgin, see, in Greek, and we are indebted to what we call the Septuagint version of the Bible, and this would be um, probably a text that Matthew also would have been familiar with and may well have understood. Here, the Greek word is virgin. So when the translation comes in, in English, behold, a virgin shall be with child, that's the way in which in Matthew's gospel that we hear this week, that term will be used. Um, some in going back and looking, see, and here's the point that I'm, uh, we're kind of looking at. Isaiah does not have the Messiah in mind. My, Isaiah has, in fact, as I mentioned, that Akaz's uh, attempt to enter into a political alliance is not what he should be doing, apparently has married a young maiden and aware that perhaps his own kingdom was not as safe as he thought, had sent her along, uh, obviously with an entourage of protection, away from where they were just in case the uh, fall of the city of Jerusalem should uh, take place. So Akaz is uh, a little bit uh, po political here, but, and here's what Isaiah says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall name him Emmanuel. So the original term, uh, Emmanuel, is used in terms of a son of Akaz, who will bear the name God with us, and there was a thinking that that son turned out to be a, a king known Hezekiah, who was re related to Akaz. Now all of that is uh, to make the point that Isaiah, although he uses this phrase, and it's very important of course, 
was in its own time aimed at a situation that was about to happen in the story of Israel in the time of Isaiah. Now, what <clears throat> Matthew does is take this phrase and now uses it with, as an appropriate way of understanding the coming of Jesus. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son and shall call him Emmanuel. <clears throat> so all of that is, would not be part of a homily you'll hear this week, but is a um, kind of source of discussion among how exactly biblical translations should be made. When the thought was that Isaiah's uh, behold a virgin could be translated behold a maiden, uh, the American bishops chose to reject that and said let us keep the uh, Greek word here virgin in both cases and that's how we will hear it because the first reading from Isaiah this week uh, is exactly that uh, phrase. That's why I spend a little bit of time in developing that. Now, uh, as we move to, and that's where the, the story ends, namely at the reading that we heard this week, and then Joseph then awoke from his dream and took Mary uh, into his household. That's the extent of the story of the birth of Jesus as Matthew tells it. There are none of the details that we are more accustomed to when we hear the Christmas story uh, coming up uh, next week. So, the marvelous birth of, of uh, the, the Messiah, and this is what's important to notice, that the conception of the child is of divine origin. Uh, and that's important to keep in mind, and that's certainly significant to remember. Divine election, therefore, is the key to understanding the source of Jesus' uh, life and how he comes uh, into this world. Now, the last line of uh, Matthew's story here in chapter 1 is not heard this time because uh, it, it raises some issues. Again, this is a biblical discussion where uh, it mentions that Joseph did not have relationships with his wife until after the birth of the child. Now, some say, does that mean, therefore, that Joseph and Mary did have relationships afterwards because, that is sexually, because there is mention of his having brothers and sisters? Well, that um, is disputed by, by theologians because of the doctrine of the perpetual virginity of Mary. But it is interesting to notice that the fact uh, mentioned in verse, this is verse 25, by the way, which is not the one we will hear this weekend, um, that the our, uh, kind of discussion of the perpetual virginity of Mary did not become an important part of Christian thought until the fourth century. See, so before that, there doesn't seem to be any biblical warrant for um, arguing for the perpetual virginity of Mary. But as a result of council decisions, and certainly as part of our whole, and this is a much more involved theological issue, uh, perception of, of, of uh, life, uh, the virginity of Mary therefore is uh, kept, kept in mind. So what is important, and uh, notice that uh, Matthew makes this point that Jesus is the firstborn. When we make the idea of firstborn, you do open the window, don't you, uh, to the possibility that there would be others uh, brought forth in this relationship. Um, just where one should go with this, um, of course, remains a theological issue, and we have to respect, again, I reiterate this as we come to an end this time, the importance of a Christian tradition honoring the virginity of Mary, uh, and that has to do, certainly in a certain way, 
This past week, we celebrated the uh, Immaculate Conception of Mary, so you can see how those things would be all connected. In a unique and marvelous way, Jesus comes among us as son of Abraham, son of David, son of God. Happy to be with you. Hope to see you again.